Is this really happening? Or there's a mix-up somewhere, is perhaps the contemplation by some, and maybe a sit back and watch what this whole story of Abakari being linked to a cocaine deal is all about. Well, whichever side of the coin it is for you, certain facts are currently incontrovertible. A once well-decorated police officer, branded in some quarters as a super cop, honored at several fora and many more for what he has come to be known for as that one police officer who has solved the puzzle of intriguing and difficult crimes, mostly around kidnapping and murder, has been arrested and in the custody of another anti-crime agency. We are talking about Deputy Commissioner of Police Abakiari. From the time he got enlisted into the Nigerian police force and got posted to Adamawa, later to Lagos and up until joining the IGP intelligence response team, IROT, it was an upward trajectory for him. Almost a 22-year stainless service. Abba's troubles started in the last few months when the Federal Bureau of Investigation indicted him following allegations that he facilitated payments to Nigerian police personnel from Instagram celebrity Ramon Abbas, also known as Hush Pepe, which eventually led to his suspension from the Nigerian police and from his position as the head of intelligence response team by the Police Service Commission in August 2021. For the rest of the year 2021 and January 2022, it did appear like nothing was going to happen as regards the extradition request to the U.S. And not much was heard or seen as an outcome of the investigation by a government institution. With intelligence at our disposal, the agency believes strongly that DCP Kerry is a member of a drug cartel that operates the Brazil-Ethiopia-Nigeria illicit drug pipeline. Many didn't see yesterday's event coming. First, the Nigeria Drug Law Enforcement Agency declared him wanted for attempting to siphon part of a cocaine haul. And just hours after that, he was arrested along with four other officers, Sunday Ubua, Bawa James, Simon Agriba, and John Nuhu. Engeli has no option but to declare DCP Agbakiari of the Nigerian police wanted right from this very moment. I must say this publicly, we are not unaware of threats to the lives of NDLA officers involved in this investigation, even as we continue to do our best to protect our officers and men in the line of duty. Before his current travels, Abakiari was a well-decorated cop. He had busted more than 80 criminal gangs and kidnappers, including the arrest of Nigeria's most notorious kidnap kingpin, Chukudumeme Onwamadike, also known as Evans in Lagos. He also led the arrest of Ishak Khalid, a 30 years old, and 13 members of his deadly Ansaru terrorist group responsible for several kidnappings, arrest of the kidnappers of elder statesman Chief Olufalaye in Ondo State, and so many others. So, what really happened? For now, his competencies are not in doubt. What is on trial is his character. The outcomes in the days ahead will definitely be an open book. Will competency match character? Olu Phillips, Channel Television News. Yeah, so Mr. Bonwa De Burua, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, joins us next to weigh in on this matter. Good morning and thank you for coming on today. Good morning, thank you. Well, 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 Th this whole thing just uh, uh, gets more interesting as the days progress. But when this news broke, uh, there were several questions as to what's going on, how will this end, the laws, of course. but. First, this officer was supposed to be under suspension. Uh, and then when this occurred, many wondered, okay, how is this going to play out between the NDLEA and the police in terms of that cooperation with the positions of the law, which are some of the things we look at now. But your immediate thoughts on his arrest so far by the NDLEA, what would that be? Well, I think like many other 
followers of this event is to say that one is uh, stupefied, one is shocked, it's quite murky because it splashes mud on the entire system. The image of Nigeria in the international community, the policing system, and indeed the lack of capacity or seeming capacity by the government of the day in dealing with issues quickly and timelessly in such a way that you're able to nip them in the board without escalating. Because if you recall the events leading to uh, this whole episode, is that uh, there was a request for extradition mm -hmm. by the United States of America. And the Inspector General of Police, with all due respect, was food dragging, you know, and treating the thing with uh, kid gloves. Uh, he claimed suspension. Uh, there were indeed, indeed, there was a team that was set up to probe, which came out with a report that suggests some kind of mild infraction. And so it was a drama between the Inspector General of Police and the Police Service Commission. You recall that the Police Service Commission rejected the report and insisted that they had to be reprobed. So if we had trusted the judgment of the IGP on Abia Kari, we probably would have exonerated him and not extradite uh, him as requested by the US. And then you recall the way the Attorney General himself had not acted swiftly in line with the request from the United States of America. But for the event that happened on Monday uh, through the NDLA, mm -hmm. I'm sure one day we'll just wake up and see that Mr. Kerry will have been reabsorbed into the Nigerian police force. You think that will happen? I, 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 I think that was where, uh, with all due respect, the Special General Police was walking towards. Because if you look at the events, it will seem that uh, the super cop was in the good books of those in power. Otherwise, if you are suspended effectively from an organization and somebody else is be appointed to replace you, I think uh, ACP Tunji Disu or so, yeah. how do you have the capacity and the authority to still mobilize serving officers of the same unit that he called his boys? mobilize them to go as far as they knew to go as, uh, you know, why he's on suspension, so, which means he was actually in charge of that agency, even on the alleged suspension, because that's what has happened in this case, that he was still able to exercise reasonable control over uh, people who are uh, supposed yeah. to be in power. So, and, and that speaks to our system, because, you know, we need to be careful mm -hmm. in order not to demoralize uh, other officers who are still working in several agencies and are doing their best patriotically to be able to nip crime in the board. And also, on the other hand, we also shouldn't uh, give the impression that we are trying to uh, nip the events under the carpet, yeah. you know, as it were. So we have to strike a balance that, between uh, uh, the decisions that we take in respect of the carry matter. And that's where, you know, when you say that... Um it casts a lot of shadow and questions as to the entire system. One wonders, will this arrest have happened if the NDLEA and the police didn't have some sort of cooperation? Because if he was still really in the good books of certain people, will this arrest have happened? You know, Chamberlain, because of the reputation of the government we are dealing with, and I talk about reputation advisedly, in terms of lack of trust. A lot of theories abound now that this whole episode may just be a small screen to avoid extradition. That's a theory that is on the table. Because under the Extradition Act, if there's a, if there's a request for somebody to be tried in another country, and you want to avoid that, all you need to do is to charge the person to court in your local jurisdiction for him to face trial, maybe for a mild offense. So there is such a law indeed? Oh yeah, there's, the Extradition Act is in existence and it says clearly that once the person who is subject of the request for extradition is facing trial in the local jurisdiction, you cannot, he has to go through that process. So if Abiyakari is charged to court by NDLA or the Nigeria police, that is the end of the extradition for now. So, that, what, yeah. who, who so that's now? why there is that so it's conspiracy. Temporary. Theory. Let's imagine that you know, it's that that plays out. Who in all of these now 
might be playing that card deliberately or not? Well, honestly, if you look at the history of this government, I'm talking about the government of President Mohamed Buhari, is to say that you can't put anything past this particular regime in terms of experience. You know, because, I mean, recall the agencies that we have dealt with in the course of this regime. Let's go to EFCC. You know, as you sit here, we don't know the status of Mr. Ibrahim Magu, whether he's still in the agency, whether he's suspended, whether he's been exonerated. So you have a regime that is lackadaisical, that sits on critical issues without taking a decision and hold Nigerians to ransom, and everybody begins to guess or to wait for the body language of those who are in power. So that's why I personally, I think that you know, a, a lot is, is possible, that this is, may just be an attempt to avoid the eventual extradition right now, by uh, the United States. Right now, sir, there are two agencies at the forefront, the NDLA and the police. Which of them do you think, if they build a case against this gentleman as we speak now, will forestall that extradition request? Well, if the story we have seen is correct, that Mr. Kerry is part of a cartel, a drug cartel, uh, between Nigeria, Ethiopia, Brazil, and he's been caught red-handed, as shown in the video, uh, surely he has to go through trial. And that process is that he has to be disengaged from the Nigeria police first. Not suspended? No. Uh, has, if, if there is such weighty allegation, he has to go through the room trial within the police system. That's what the law requires. You go through the police disciplinary process first because you have to derobe him as a serving officer. It's the same with all the uh, military agencies. And you also recall the case of Ngajiwa and Federal Republic of Nigeria where a serving judge was alleged to uh, be involved in corruption. And the Court of Appeal said, look, as so long as he's still a serving judicial officer, you need to go through the National Judicial Council and derobe him first, and then he come and face trial. It's the same thing with the agency. So he has to go through the room trial. He'll be dismissed from the force, and then you hand him over to the NDLA as an ordinary Nigerian. But well, he's with the trial. NDLA now, according to NDLA. Uh, there has to be some collaboration. Yeah. He can do the trial. It's not a hard and fast room. The well, room when, trial can When go. you say uh, temporary, that they will not be able to extract that. And does that mean that if he goes through all this process and he does his time on the law, he still can go for that particular question that they want to ask of him internationally? Well, you know, what we try to avoid within the legal system is uh, what we call double, double jeopardy. jeopardy. Um, that a person will not go no. through the same trial but twice. If there are two but different, if they are different that's what I wanted to explain. The case in the United States is involving uh, hush pop, uh, about $1.1 million, uh, Yahoo, internet, uh, or some kind of scam or fraud. And this one in Nigeria has to do with drug. And the circumstances are different. The subject matter is different. The personalities are different. So if Nigeria wants to put him to trial for drug trafficking, he has to go through that process, go through trial, go through the process of exhausting his right of appeal to the Court of Appeal, to the Supreme Court, until the case is finally determined and is exhausted all his remedies under the law, he will then be subjected to extradition and go and face the trial there. So while this Nigeria scenario is going on, you cannot send him to the United States of America. So, you know, this is a case that has built for months now. A long time and people have had time to really look at this from different angles and this is where we are right now is there any way this ends because I mean you talked about the conspiracy theories how this I mean we're choosing it mean, might be choosing a lesser evil I mean trial here as opposed to extradition so is there any way this ends that is a lesser evil what are the options ahead for him the general thinking within the Nigerian public is that when people who are highly influential in government get involved in this kind of scenario, scandals, you may call it, there's always some kind of soft landing from our experience. And so if you ask me, I would doubt the capacity of the system, I'm talking about the police and the NDLA, to properly see this 
to its logical conclusion because of the antecedents. Even the NDLA. Even the NDLA. And, if not be, and the reason why I say even the NDLA is this. In handing over the suspects to the NDLA, the Inspector General of Police threw a bomb and said, look, within your own agencies, there are people who are complicit. There are people who facilitate. And you know the danger in all this is that you just use the system at your own advantage at the expense of the public. This whole scenario has revealed that NDLA officers buy drugs from suspects and resell it to the young people, to youths. And that's the example we've seen in Abiyakari's case. So it's not just the police. The NDLA needs overhaul. Because what this has shown is to indict the agency itself, that dummy samples of drugs are being given in place of the original. But the statement says that that, a, that agent in particular got approval from the NDLA to sort of play along. So wasn't this a plan no, that, from the scratch already? No, I'm saying that you just see what happened in February 2022, what happened in 2021, what happened in 2020, what's been happening in the agency. Do you it, have proof of that? No, but that's what, has clearly, what this has shown. The video and the evidence show clearly that there was some kind of opportunity open for people who hold positions of prosecution, investigation, but, but to that, swap. Can that still be said to be happening now that uh, General Mawa is there? Because he said, look, whatever must have been happening previously, then now he's there to make sure they stamp out anyone who is found culpable. I don't think he's in a position to tell us that, with all due respect. Why and the not? reason is this. From what we have seen in these agencies, EFCC, the police, NDLA, those who are in power have the capacity to put things under the carpet. There has to be some independent probe of these agencies if we need to get to the root of this, of the police system, of the NDLA, of the EFCC, because you know the kind of things they are exposed to brings too much temptation as we have seen in this case. And so you can't trust those who are in power to use their own objective determination to come out with a result that will be independent, that will be uh, uh, reasonable and acceptable to everybody in Nigeria. In incidentally, pardon me, I mean, I recall Jeremy Marwa saying that you need to do better by these agents, you know, pay them well, pay them better and all that. But that's a different conversation, really. Perhaps it has its own effect on this. But back to my first question, the options ahead for him. This is a drug-related case, and I'm sure you, you have a lot to refer to regarding this. What, what are the possibilities in terms of conviction, uh, you know, time and the rest? What, what are the possibilities ahead? Well, unlike when Mr. Ibrahim Magu went through his own trial, he, he had a lawyer, and you could hear his own version. We were hearing different sides. You know, I, I, I take some little caution. I exercise a lot of caution to trust statements coming from government agencies, even in this case. Because when a government leaves on propaganda, it becomes difficult for you to trust them. So it's when you get to court, when Kerry is out, he has a lawyer, his defense is unveiled, before you even be shocked that all this may just be a make-believe. But, so but, I'm just saying but, but that everything to me uh, still looks like drama. I always trust the court. Yeah. No, of course, the court is just an umpire. He will give Kerry the opportunity to state his own defense. He will give the government to also unveil their prosecution. If this is true, surely there will be a conviction, no doubt about that. But I'm saying that from our experience generally, the issue of investigation is normally followed with force. There's no intelligence gathering. People are beaten to make confessional statements. It's not impossible that there's some blackmail, there's some um, means of trying to extort statements from people but we've seen without following due. That's what I'm saying, that until you get to the stage where everybody is free to talk, the, the people are in custody. We haven't heard their own version. So it's a difficult thing at this stage. Now, at what point are we supposed to hear their own version? When they get a lawyer and they are charged to court. Okay. If this is a serious matter, which has been followed all through, the evidence is available, there are documentary, there's a video. We should be talking about the next two weeks. Uh, these people should be in court. Okay. In fact, that, that's they, where... In the next two weeks, that's... if they can't get to court in two weeks' time, then you know mm -hmm. that all this is just... There was a lot of question and back and forth in different quarters about this, in terms of 
NDLA having made the arrest, number one, under what circumstances can they arrest him? He's still a police officer, even though they say he's on suspension. So can the NDLA prosecute him as the case presently is now? What powers do they have? Where does the police come in in this prosecution process? Well, under the act establishing the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, he has power of prosecution over anybody apart from those who enjoy immunity under the constitution, that's the president, vice, governor, and the deputy. Every other person in Nigeria who is accused or suspected to be involved in drug trafficking can be subjected to trial. But as I've, as I've explained to you, so long as Mr. Kerry is still a deputy commissioner of police on suspension, mm -hmm. he has to go through his own orderly room trial within, Where, the, police, police? within oh. the police force and be derobed and then he be then exposed to the NDLA to go through trial. What if the police says, look, he's under suspension. He's not in our custody. The NDLA, do whatever investigation, carry out whatever, go on with whatever process you want. We have no say here for now. There has to be a synergy because we're talking about Nigeria, our image. And that's why when you review this, you look at the circumstances. Uh, we declare Abiyakari wanted. That's NDLA. Mm -hmm. IG says, no, we have arrested him. And within some minutes, they are in court. And what we now hear is that been, they've been in custody since Friday, before the press conference of Monday. They have been in the custody with the police since Friday, last week. So what is the drama about declaring him wanted? The police has been in custody with the police since Friday, four days. Could it be maybe there was some attempt to not hand him over to the NDLA? Well, that's why I keep saying that, you know, when it comes to Nigeria... That's speculative, though. You know, you know I'm can, telling you the truth, Chamberlain. This is our experience. <laughs> that's why you take what comes from this particular... I'm talking about this particular regime. You take it with a pinch of salt. A pinch of salt. All right. Just before we throw this to Abuja, to Parkway, yes. uh, you spoke about institutions the other time and that there is a need to just up the entire system and all of that. I'm just wondering, uh, how they referenced this earlier, maybe you need to speak to it. What is it that institutionally makes officers vulnerable, institutionally speaking now? He referenced welfare. Uh, we can't give that excuse, but for you, historically or whatever, what is it that makes officers such as Abakiari and others in the NDLA that uh, the police have, uh, as far as they are concerned, are also indicted? What is it that makes them vulnerable? It's politics. That's just a simple truth. Politicians deploy their authority to use people involved in investigation and in prosecution to witch hunt people to achieve other objectives apart from that which uh, they were established to do. Not welfare. No, let me explain what I mean by politics. When it's time for government to hunt people that they consider in opposition, then they unleash these agencies, these institutions against them. So in that, in that wise, the person gathers a lot of power. Impunity is also involved because it's serving the interests of the person in power. He's not checked. He becomes arrogant. He becomes excessive in the excess of power and then uncontrollable. But because the person who is in power is enjoying the uh, services being rendered to hunt, which hunt certain people, they go unchecked. Because look at the history of EFCC, for instance, from Ribadu to Lamode to Farida Waziri to Magu. It's been the same story. It's been the same story. So these institutions do not work in line with the law setting them up. They serve the people who are in power. They are not interested in due prosecution. I mean, if you check the history of the prosecuting agencies, the bias that we witness in terms of arrest, prosecution, you see somebody who is in APC, we said to have committed the same offense, he's, gone, he's going scot free walking the street, you see somebody in the uh, Abga who has been arrested. So what we want is an agency that has autonomy. Agency that has independence. Agency that is not subject to political but, influence. But the law hasn't provided, to some extent, hasn't provided that independence to some of these agencies. No. Either the way their, super, their commanding officers are appointed. No. Eventually end no, let me take you to EFCC uh, Chamberlain. The EFCC Act has a board. 
It's, it, it, the, the, the board specified, the act specified that there should be a board. And it's proper board as in board that meets, take decisions, review policies. But appointed by who? They are appointed by the president. Mm -hmm. so the I same thing with the, uh, the, the IGP. So what I'm saying is that same thing with some judges. Those things don't same function. Thing with INEC. They don't function. Same thing with because those who are in power, he use them for other purposes. So okay. the person who is the chairman of the FCC has overshadowed the board. You don't even know their members. They don't even meet. Okay. All right. Uh, let's bring Mark and she has some questions for you as well. Mark. Good morning, Mr. Degborua. Let me quickly ask this about the derobing which you referred to. You talked about how he needs to go through an orderly room trial within the police before he can be taken to the court. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now that he has been sent over to the NDLEA and the NDLEA has confirmed that he is in their custody, what exactly is a, are they supposed to be doing with him as it currently stands? Shh. Are they supposed to complete their investigation first before sending him back to the police? Or could they from here take him to the court, assuming they find, I mean, and they already say they have a trove of evidence that those are their words uh, against him. What are they supposed to be doing with him in their custody? Well, for those who are in custody who are still serving in the Nigeria Police Force in this particular case, what is required is that the NDLA by now should be gathering his own report, intelligence report, and do a statement, a finding, a kind of report that will show prima facie that an offense has been committed. That report should be forwarded to the police authorities who would, based on that report, conduct a room trial and then come up with their own decision. But if there is no willpower to do that, in the absence of that, for instance, as you have asked, they can be charged to court by the NDLA, even while serving, if there is unwillingness on the part of the police authorities to do the needful. Because you've seen the ding-dong between the IG and the Police Service Commission. But for what happened on Monday, the Police Service Commission had given two weeks ultimatum to the IG to review the case of Abakari for the purpose of extradition. And, and this has just only added Philip to that. So they can be charged to court even while serving if there is no willpower by the police authorities to subject them to a room trial. Okay, so they have, anyway, I'll come back to that issue. But let, let's talk about um, investigating past, um, past arrests, you know, or past investigations conducted by uh, Mr. Abakiari. There have been those who have now started calling for an investigation into. Uh, investigations conducted in the past by him. Do you think that this is necessary? Not at all. I don't think so. Uh, and the reason Why? is very simple. Uh, he is not the only uh, serving police officer or law enforcement agent that is being involved in um, scandalous uh, allegations. Uh, the fact that he is involved in this drug cartel will not of necessity taint all the uh, investigations he's conducted in the past, particularly people who are facing trial already. If you look at the case of uh, 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 Evans, for instance, we can't say because Mr. Carey is now alleged to be involved in uh, drug uh, uh, trafficking, then you set aside all the investigations conducted in respect of such matters. The cases will be dealt with on their own merits. It's left for the suspects or those who are involved or anybody who is a victim to come out and state the facts. But we can't do a blanket rejection of all these previous investigations just because of this particular isolated matter. But if there's a link between this and any other case he has investigated in the past, those involved should come up, should be bold enough to come up with such allegations which should be investigated and if verified, then steps can be taken. But we can't do a blanket rejection based on these events. Okay. Let me go back to the statement of the Nigeria police, which they released in the wake of handing over Mr. Kiari to the NDLEA. Uh, they talked about having conducted their own in-house investigation 
uh, which they said the IGP ordered, and that they found they established reasonable grounds for strong suspicion that the IRT officers involved in the operation could have been involved in some underhand and unprofessional dealings, as well as official corruption, which compromised ethical standards in their dealings with the suspects and exhibits recovered. They also say the police investigation established that the international narcotics cartel involved um, have strong ties with the officers of the NDLEA, where, where they were also trying to, uh, well, where they also indicted, it was seen, NDLEA officials, which they, whom they said were on the payroll of these uh, uh, narcotic officers. But what I'm trying to establish here was that the police already conducted his own in-house investigations, uh, on the strength of which they sent him to the NDLEA. Shouldn't that be, have been enough for the police to conduct their own orderly room trial uh, before sending him to the NDLEA? Well, Malpe, I verily believe, uh, unless I'm proved wrong, that the police authorities had an interest to serve in respect of Mr. Kiari's case generally. And, but for the NDLA involvement in this particular case, we may never have heard all this. This kind of statement from the police authorities, as far as I'm concerned, is self-serving. It's just to save face. Otherwise, I mean, you know that this hush puppy thing has been on for over uh, close to one year now. And we've not had a detailed report from the police on a matter that is purely documentary, on a matter that the FBI had investigated and we have evidence and the accomplice is already going through trial and confessed. So for me, uh, generally, the police in Nigeria can do well if they have the intention to do so and are not interested in any subject matter. But once there's an interest, you can't get the best out of the police. So the statement for me is enough to show that there is room to proceed on an orderly room trial by the police. But they also go through that trial and offer his defense. Otherwise, the statement on Twitter has not shown his own side of the story or what his defense could be. And our law presumes somebody innocent until otherwise proved guilty. So he has to go through that trial for us to indeed know that a prima facie case has been established against him. But for the NDLA, they can charge him to court at any time once a prima facie case is established. Okay, it is interesting that you say that in, despite that, it doesn't tie the hands of the NDLE from proceeding. Uh, but, you know, there is no way we can talk about Mr. Kiari without talking about SARS. And you were very involved in uh, prosecuting, oh, beg your pardon, in the judicial panel, uh, which conducted hearings into um, atrocities committed by SARS officials. And we do know that Mr. Uh, Kiari, you know, oversaw SARS in Lagos at some point. They made some important breakthroughs while he was in Lagos, but at the same time, there were serious... Um, allegations of um, high-handedness and uh, doing things that ought not to have been done, you know, allegations pressed against SARS officials. Uh, should we be looking into those complaints once again? Thank you very much. Uh, apart from the fact that we looked at the allegations against uh, the special anti-robbery squad generally, we had a specific petition involving Mr. Carey in the matter that unveiled in the NDLA case. And we investigated it and made our report. Uh, so what happened is that generally, the Nigerian police lacks capacity for proper investigation. This is the truth. In the over 180 petitions that um, we uh, uh, investigated uh, in the NSAS uh, panel, for instance, it was clear that the police normally do adopt torture, physical brutality, in, in, in trying to extract uh, confessional statements from suspects. And that cuts across generally, not just Lagos, not just SARS, the general police and other law enforcement agencies. So the issue of funding is important. There must be a way intelligence can be gathered without physical interaction, without physical combat, without physical torture of suspects. Because that's what obtains in advanced jurisdictions, that the police is so equipped with enough uh, equipment, enough operational facilities that will enable them to get the truth out of you even when you're unwilling. But the experience in Nigeria, not just for SARS, but general investigating agencies, is that you need to beat people 
You need to handcuff them. You need to hang them on the ceiling. You need to torture them even to the point of death. Wow. Does that still happen? It happens every day. It's happening even today. Is the ACJ against that? Oh, not just ACJ, the Nigerian Constitution in particular, Section 34 of our Constitution. It's against treatment with cruelty or inhuman dignity. Do they it's know? against torture. Do the police officers know then? Because, I mean, that's, they're, they're meant to be enforcers of that Constitution. Well, what we also discover in the NSAT panel is, is the issue of training for police personnel. There seems to be a lot of ignorance within the lower rank. Yeah. The information in the police is normally better when you get the to rank. the higher rank. And they, well, they behave much better. And the higher rank don't interact with suspects because they are not on the field. It's the lower ranks that go out to uh, execute arrests. And those lower ranks have their own understanding of the law differently. They don't believe in the constitution. Well, or they, they don't know the constitution. Well, and the only thing they know is that look, just obey. If Mr. you don't obey, we'll beat you up. Yeah. The higher ranking officers didn't get there. They came from the lower the ranks. Height. They came from the lower ranks. No, no, no. What happened is this. In the, in the forces now, if you want to get higher and you're a university graduate, you probably come in as a cadet or something. Yeah. We're talking about okay, private recruits. Those, those who are just being recruited now, who have been trained in police college, Constable. you know, who, who, who don't eat food or eat once in a day, and they transfer the aggression to uh, the citizens. But if you're a graduate and you're joining the police, you probably start... It's different. Yeah. You know, so it's always but different. What happened to the report that uh, the panel made against him? Do you know if anything is being done about it? I think that from my uh, understanding, you know, there were two reports. There's a general report involving uh, police brutality. And then there's a second report, a report involving a lucky toe incident. I think in respect of the first report, which is where Abakari's case uh, uh, was uh, concluded and forwarded, I believe government accepted virtually all our recommendations. And these matters are being treated by the so, government. I believe so. For the IRT now, what should happen to them? Because he said that there are some people who are still loyal or working with him. What should happen to that team at the moment? I think if you ask me, is to ask the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, who has statutory authority, not only over the police, but over all the other agencies, to summon courage to be able to overhaul the Nigeria police force. Because if you look at the scenario of the Abiyakari matter, is that the current IGP left to handle this matter won't get the best out of it. Look at the wedding of his son, where Mr. Kerry attended and posted pictures. Should they have uh, not allowed him to come into that wedding? Or no, I'm saying that such open fraternity with somebody that you are supposed to be probing, you know, to the extent of that social media interaction, openly fraternizing with somebody that you have just disciplined, and you're supposed to come up with a report for the people of Nigeria and the international community. So I believe that personally, from what I have read and seen, it will be difficult to trust the current leadership of the police to but, handle Abiyakari's matter. Mr. Not just that matter, but matters involving discipline, matters involving corruption. But, because the truth is that unless maybe God will come down and tell us what is inside Mr. Kari or other police officer, there's no way he could go ahead in this fashion without those who are higher than him being in the law. But you are the one in law who always says that everyone is innocent until proven guilty. Mm -hmm. No, I'm talking about overhauling the police. No, no, no. When you talked about the fraternization, he's not been proven guilty. Yeah, he was on suspension. Well? He was on suspension by the same person who organized the wedding. And then, so if the person who you suspect to have committed an offense and who is there's a request for extradition, and it's still go ongoing. Left to me, it was in bad taste. Mm. Then it was in bad taste. The big question about proceeds of crime. We've seen this in different agencies. There's a certain mindset about it that, well, the, they seem to be above the law when it comes to that. We see the same question with the EFCC, same questions about the police in some cases, even in the military. We look at what the EFCC said they've seized from a top military officer. How should we approach this? Uh, currently, there is no law regulating this. So they do with it uh, whatever what, they what deem fit. The best the AG did was sometimes in 2020, he made some kind of uh, executive order in respect of non-conviction uh, forfeiture by which his office was to coordinate proceeds 
involving a lot of conviction uh, for future. But of course, the FCC has been up in arms against the AG in respect of that. I think the National Assembly currently is working on uh, legislation to regulate proceeds of crime. Until that is passed and assented to by the president, as we are sitting here, it's the heads of those agencies that determine what happens to those. In fact, if we could shock you, is that, and, and I don't know why that became a matter of public policy, those agencies are entitled to 10% of cocaine. Oh, no, no I'm talking about the cash, okay. not, not cocaine, please. Okay. I'm talking about the Just to be clear. Just to be clear. They're entitled to 10%. Okay, right. you know, officially, we shouldn't be. The agencies involved in investigation should be funded by government. Whatever you recover in the course of your investigation should go into custody as exhibit. Mm. The government should have another agency that should deal with that. And indeed, that's what's causing problems for most heads of these agencies. Permit but, me to, my, my apologies, Carly. You, you, you said that the police needs an overhaul. What is it that, that needs really to be done? What kind of, when there is an overhaul, what are the ex likely outcomes that you're expecting? You would remember that the ICPC is supposed, to, it, part of the functions of the uh, police is the ICPC, they weren't doing this, so ICPC came on board, EFCC, the same thing, all the extracts of, of police functions going into these agencies. So if you're talking about an, a police overhaul, what do you intend, or what do you hope to see that will justify that indeed this police will now do its job? Now, overhaul is, one issue of funding. We got evidence from the NSAS panel that police officers are responsible for procuring their equipment, their uniforms, the boots, everything they use, they buy it personally with their own money. Up to their own, everything. And that's not supposed to be so. Now, the accommodation, the welfare, the places they stay, the training they go through makes them become frustrated and desperate. And so they transfer this aggression, this frustration to the citizens in terms of interaction. So when you talk about overhaul, you talk about proper funding, then you talk about training. What we also discover is that policemen are not aware of the rights of the citizens. They're not aware on the average that, for instance, if a citizen is arrested, he's not supposed to be forced to make a statement. He's supposed to have access to his lawyer. He's supposed to be informed of the reasons for the arrest. You know, in which circumstances do you handcuff people? How do you treat people with cruelty? The police people were not aware from the people we interacted with at the panel. So there has to be funding. Then second thing, uh, the third thing I think is medical examination. Because before you expose somebody to handle firearms, you must be sure that the person is mentally stable. What kind of level of uh, delayed provocation can you subject him to before he begins to fire you? You know, so before you get somebody to go and handle firearm, he must have gone through some level of training that would really make him to become temperate, even in the height of provocation. Such as we saw at the NSAS panel where a police officer was slapped severely and he didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And we had to honor him, you know, at that time. Well, there's, there's no way we'll have this conversation with you. And we've touched on it without talking NSAS, the panel, the outcome. And, you know, it happened then and we thought... We're on the verge of something big. We're on the verge of a major change in Nigeria. For you, I mean, being part of that panel, you know, you submitted the, the report and all. How close are we to getting a closure uh, to NSARS? Uh, we got it in Lagos right, half and half. And what I mean by half and half is this. The governor actually set up a compensation fund prior to the takeoff of the NSARS panel. 200 million naira at first and then subsequently another 200 million naira. So that once we go through a petition and we find it meritorious, we award compensation and pay immediately. And to that extent, we paid the entire 400 million naira that was released and even asked for more. So it was about 430 million naira, which was paid directly to victims. So in that regard, a lot of progress was made in healing people. The money may not bring back the people who have died. It may not restore uh, the injuries. But at least you were able to, in some cases, bring the aggressor to come and face the victim. You make them accountable. The sense that I'm above the law was no longer there because we brought people to come and face their victims. And their apologies were made, healing or called reconciliation. So that was achieved. But the other point about the one that's critical to the youth which is at the Lekito Gate incidents. 
we shouldn't allow politics to derail the purpose of that exercise. Otherwise, there has to be that interaction. What we expected was government to use the report to get across and engage the young people and bring them over. Talk, sit down. What areas of this report can we look at? How do we get here? How do we achieve this? Rather than the kind of propaganda that we saw. So I Isn't think that, that what the work was meant to achieve, that work for peace? Wasn't that meant to achieve some sort of, you know, coming together? No, there's no peace without justice. You can't achieve peace if there is no equity, if there is no justice. And I think that was the gap. And I think it's still on the table. And I believe the governor should be working on it, that he should use the report to engage yeah, the but, young people. But the ultimate intention was for different states come up with the report, get it to the national level, then government takes a decision. I believe that, that the report is to be forwarded to the National Executive Council, mm -hmm. which actually brought the initiative. And so what we did was that, in our own case, for instance, we sent some of our recommendations even to the National Assembly, especially petitioners that have judgments which uh, some, some uh, money had been awarded in their favor for torture, for breach of their fundamental rights. So I still expected that the government of Lagos State, along with other states, will collate this report and present it to the National Executive Council for implementation. Otherwise, it will just be like a political smooth screen. And I All don't right. think that to be fair. Okay, we'll go to break, but we'll return and wrap this up in just a moment. Don't go away. Welcome back. It's our concluding moment now. Well, having looked at all these other matters, but it turns out that, that there are issues of development that we need to mainstream. There are issues of uh, uh, judiciary, for instance. I know that uh, some time ago the question as to Executive Order 10 came into fruition. But when that decision came through, were you, did you expect that, of course, that, that was the way the judgment was going to go in the first place? No, I didn't expect. The judiciary missed the opportunity to rescue itself. I didn't expect that judgment at all. Uh, in, and, and the reason is this. It's been a long journey for us to free judiciary from the executive, and the executive in particular, the governors. The problem we've had with judicial independence, autonomy, is the overbearing influence of the governors. And unless we remove that, we can't yet get justice for the ordinary man on the street. Unless we get to a stage when judiciary will have control of his own funds, so long as the governor succeeds in sitting on the fund of the, ex of the judiciary, let's forget about getting effective justice administration. So the Supreme Court missed that opportunity to be able to clearly articulate a position that will free the heads of the courts, that will allow the Accountant General of the Federation to release money directly from the Consolidated Revenue Fund, directly to an account nominated by the Chief Judge, not to take the money of the judiciary through the government of the state. How do you expect a chief judge to go and be lobbying a accountant general of a state, to lobby the attorney general of a state, to lobby the governor of a state, those who have cases before him? But I, I How does that work? Aren't they two different things? If, because it's a federal system, can the federal government be dictating to the states how they should get their funds to the judiciary, or shouldn't they have said, okay, look, at the state level, we restructure it at that level, and not the federal government dictating to the states how it should happen. No, it's not dictation. What the Constitution says clearly, through the amendment that was achieved by the Eighth National Assembly, led by Senator Bukola Saraki, is to change the character of Section 163 to ensure that money meant for the judiciary will not go through the state. This is the objective. This is the autonomy we are campaigning for. So it's not a matter of the president tampering with the funds of the state. The judiciary is the third arm of government. It is not subsumed under the executive of that state. It's an organ agency on its own that's standing alone. So what we are advocating for is that the money meant for that judiciary should not pass through the executive. Does the because law... the legislator have their own uh, their budget, executive has their own budget, the judiciary should have his own budget. Does the constitution permit the governors to sit on the money. No. The, exactly. So no, that's why I'm saying the Supreme Court missed the opportunity. My point here is, if the constitution already spells out the way it ought to be, and the, does that mean then that the governors have been operating the constitution in breach? Oh, yes. If that is the case, who then should be taking that case? Well, that's why, you, you know, when a victim is unable to... Um, properly marshal his complaint 
then you probably say you don't cry more than they believed. Mm. And that's why I said, for many of us, we, 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 we got that judgment mm. with a lot of no, shock. Was that, was that particular case the prayer that was in court? If the executive order 10, the purpose yeah. of executive order 10 was to ensure that the money that is meant for the judiciary will be paid directly by the federal government over and above the government. The, post, the, po the point here is... And that's is, what the Constitution says. The, that's what the Constitution says. Yes. My point here is the Constitution is being operated in breach yes. by the chief executives of the states. You need to take mm. them to court no, no, no. to get can, a judgment can, against wait, them. Can, can he say so based on that Supreme Court judgment now? No, you see, before the Supreme Court can judgment... No, the Supreme Court judgment only says or let executive order 10 go. He didn't say uh, that you shouldn't pay the money to the judiciary. Exactly. In fact, so before that, to before, before that, that judgment, Dusun had obtained judgment from the Federal High Court. Dr. Lisa Bakoba, SAN, had obtained judgment from the Federal High Court asking that money be paid directly. It's just that governors don't obey it. You know, this is a very rare case where the judiciary is judge and respondent in its own case. <laughs> yeah, well. And you said it's a missed opportunity. It's but a should, missed opportunity. Should that stop the judiciary from still dispensing justice free and fairly, wherever, if, whoever is sitting on the, on the funds? Should that stop the judiciary from doing its, its job of dispensing justice without fairness, or, sorry, without favor and all that? He who pays the piper dictates the tune. And dictates the judgment as well. Oh, but, but, I mean, I have, we've had an instance, for instance, where a governor was to go and present the budget for the judiciary for the year, a, a chief judge rather, and was in the waiting room of his excellency. And some other senior lawyers were there when the governor suddenly came in and said, ah, uh, CJ, you are here. What of our case, so, so, and so, and so case, you know? And what that shows clearly is this. You rob my back, I rob. So if you want to lobby for money, you also help us undo our matters. Oh, dear. Oh, yes. And politics. Speaking about politics, I mean, yeah. they are doing that thing again. So who knows? Largely this year might be a lot of political stories and issues hugging the headlines and the front pages, pushing a lot of things to the background. Now, this question about zoning, which both parties seem to be at daggers drawn over, what, what do you think about all of that? I think that, I mean... In our national life, we should be sensitive. Uh, and that's why Section 14 was inserted into the Constitution, you know, to avoid a dominance of either political or economic power by a particular section of the country against other sections. So if you put that Section 14 to play, I think fairness will say that in the coming dispensation of the 2023 general elections, all political parties should have candidates who come from the southern part of the country. That's equity. That's justice. That accords with the framework and the mind of those who drafted that constitution. But that does not preclude other people. No, it doesn't. Other I'm, not saying it, I'm not saying it precludes. I'm just saying that that is the directive principle. If you go to chapter two of the constitution, the heading is directive principle how the state should be run, how Nigeria, our expectation for Nigeria, one of those principles is federal character. And that federal character says that there should be no aggregation of a particular uh, uh, section or dominance of power. So if uh, Major General um, President Mohamed Buhari is in power uh, and has been in power since 2015, exhaust uh, second tenor, is going to uh, finish his tenor in 2023, it will be totally unexpected to say that the next person who will come after him should also come from the north. It will be totally unexpected. All right, but not, illegal. To... not illegal. Okay. Not illegal. <laughs> oh dear. Okay, well, we have to thank you for coming on, Mr. Ebola Adeguro, our senior advocates of Nigeria. Thank you very much. We'll be back in a moment and still weighing on the this whole matter about the police. That will be in just a moment. Don't go away.